Welcome to the Don't Call It Small Business Podcast, powered by Foreman and Associates, LLC, a consulting and professional development services firm. I'm your host, Natasha Foreman. Our podcast provides professionals and organizational leaders with helpful advice, tips, and business news that you can use for training, development, strategic realignment, and more. We examine the tough questions and issues impacting our businesses, households, and communities. If you like what you hear and find the content useful, please share us with your inner circle. Now that we've covered that and you've learned a little about us and why we do what we do, let's get to work. Join us for today's episode. Hey everyone, it's Natasha Foreman. Thank you so much for joining me on the Don't Call a Small Business Podcast. Oh wow, here we are, episode 99, part 12 of how to start a business or of course revamp, reinvent, reimagine, reset your already established business. Woo, we have gone through a lot over the past uh, several weeks. I mean, goodness gracious, I hope that this has been helpful in not only with um, creating or um, re, you know refreshing your business plan, but also in all the elements that make up the operations and management of your company. Um, whether you are a newbie to um, the marketplace or if you've been established for some years. So without further delay, I will say that if this is your first time joining us, you need to just go ahead and pause this and go back to episode 88. Start with um, part one and then work your way down the path to here. You are not behind, my friend. You are right on time. There is no rush and um, you are good to go. For the rest of you, you've got your note-taking instruments. All right, so um, last week we were looking at, you know, how do you go about, you know, pitching or how do you go about um, attracting your investors, right? And um, all of that that entails. So I want to look at something that we talked about at the last episode, but also a previous episode was about um, risk mitigation. And um, I briefly mentioned a risk mitigation plan. I want to help explain how to create a risk mitigation plan. And then I'm also going to talk to you about pitching your ideas to investors. So um, the RMP involves systematically identifying potential risk to your business and then you're going to develop strategies to minimize their impact right so the first step would be risk identification so you have to identify the potential risk that could impact your business that could be financial operational market legal and a slew of other risks Um, You have to then conduct a thorough analysis of internal and external factors that could pose a risk. So you and your team, as well as those outside of your your team, that could be a risk. Um, Then step two would be categorizing the risk. So you need to group them into categories to better understand and manage them. So this could involve um, categorizing them by type, such as strategic, operational, financial, or compliance risk. Step three would be assessing their impact and likelihood. So you have to evaluate what's the likelihood of this happening and what's the potential impact. And if you use a scale like low, medium, high, then you can rank both the impact and the likelihood. Um, So, you know, you may be like, what about an alien invasion? They're coming from another dimension or whatever the case may be. Well, what's the likelihood of that happening? And if it does, what's the potential impact on your company? I just threw that out there. Um, (laughs) So um, four would be prioritizing risk. So that would be the fourth step. You're going to base that on their severity. So it's going to be a combination of impact and likelihood, right? And you'll focus on addressing the high priority risk first because, of course, they pose the greatest risk to your business. Make sense? All right. Step five, you would develop your mitigation strategies. And so for each of those identified risks, you'd create specific strategies to help mitigate them. And these strategies should be outlined um, in a way that you can um, see the actions that you will take to either prevent the risk from occurring, reduce its impact, or 
or have that contingency plan, that plan B in case it materializes. Step six would be risk ownership and accountability. So here's where you clearly assign ownership of each risk to a responsible team member. Underline, highlight, circle, underscore, responsible team member. You would establish accountability for monitoring, implementing mitigation strategies, and regularly updating progress. So each person that's assigned um, one of these would then be responsible for reporting back to the team and um, and and letting everyone know what's what and how we are and where we're going, if there's any stagnation, so on and so forth, or it's cataclysmic, right? Um, step seven would be contingency planning. So once again, we're looking at those high impact risks that can't be entirely mitigated. You need a plan for that. You would outline specific steps to be taken if the risk materializes and ensuring that your team is prepared to respond effectively. Remember, respond, not react, because we are planning for it versus reacting because now we've been blindsided. Step eight, regular review and updates. You would schedule these um, and so that you're making sure that you're reviewing the risk mitigation plan. As your company evolves or external conditions change, you have to re reassess those potential risks and then update your strategies accordingly. You can't be rolling down the same path and something's now different. You're on one path and the risk that's rolling your way is on a different one. So it's going to most likely sideswipe you. This does ensure that your plan remains relevant and effective. Um, step nine, your communication plan. So you make sure you have established one so that you keep all stakeholders informed about potential risk and the steps that are being taken to mitigate them. So it's not just your investors, but it's all your internal stakeholders as well. Transparent communication helps to build that trust and ensure that everyone's on the same page. You have full buy-in. Everyone, um, you know, is good to go. Step 10, you're going to test and simulate. So periodically you need to do those tests and simulations to assess the effectiveness of your strategies. And this is a very proactive approach that helps to identify any weaknesses in your plan before a real risk event occurs. It is your dress rehearsal. So, you know, work it out. Step 11, legal and regulatory compliance. You have to ensure that your risk mitigation strategies align with legal and regulatory requirements. You can't be below them and you can't be way off on the, you know, the sidelines with it. So compliance with industry standards and regulation regulations is crucial for avoiding legal risk. You don't want, you don't want that heat. You don't want that smoke. You don't want nothing you know, surrounding any of that. 12 last, not, but not least is your employee training. You have to train your team on the RMP, ensuring that everyone understands their roles and responsibilities, because if they're well informed, they're better equipped to identify and address risk in their respective areas. They can see it. They don't have to wait until like the smoke is fully visible to then realize there's a fire. Does that make sense? Okay. So as in all of the other elements that we have been discussing over the weeks, you should know by now that this is an ongoing process and your plan should evolve as your business environment changes. So you have to regularly revisit and update your risk man, um, mitigation strategies to adapt to any new challenges and opportunities. Great. So let's look at pitching to investors. Huh. Mm. Most of you, many of you, some of you have probably seen Shark Tank and some of the other um, shows and it seems intense. Well, in some regards it is, in some other regards, some people are not. So, you know, no, thank you. Thank you, but no, thank you, you know, kind of thing. So anyway, pitching to investors is a crucial step in securing funding for your business. If you need that type of injection of funds, a compelling and well-delivered pitch can then of course capture the attention of an investor and generate interest in your organization. So here's just some things that you can use as some tips to kind of help guide you. You have to, number one, understand your audience. Oh my gosh, you really do. You have to research those investors to understand their preferences, their investment focus, and past investments. You have to tailor your pitch to align with their interests and criteria. 
you can't be up here coming at them and you're a food based business and here they're doing something that's in construction. They're just looking at you like, but why? Like, what does the two have to do with anything other than our construction folks need food? Like, does that make sense? So you got to make sure that you understand them. And it's a bigger insult to them when they realize that you haven't done research on them. That you just saw money and you're trying to pounce on it. So that's a great way to get rejected. Um, so you have to understand your audience. Number two, you need to create, um, craft that compelling story, as I've mentioned a couple of times so far. Um, it has to be compelling and concise, and it has to highlight the problem your business solves, the market opportunity, and why your solution is unique. And then it has to be able to engage them from the start. From start to finish, you got to keep them engaged. So it's just like a business letter, an email, that first paragraph, boom, you either clinch them or you don't. So you got to get them up front. Um, so let's see, three, clearly define the problem and solution as I just talked about. It's how well you can articulate the problem that your target customers face and how your product and or service is going to solve the problem. You have to be specific and you have to demonstrate a deep understanding of your target market. You have to be able to show that you have an intimate awareness and an acknowledgement of their needs and their fears and how you plan on resolving them and comforting them and having a great, long, beautiful relationship with them. When that is conveyed, that you're not just winging it, it gives greater appreciation and respect, but also attention from potential investors. Um, four, market opportunity. You should be able to present a clear and attractive market opportunity. You'll highlight the size of the market, its growth potential, and how your business aims to capture a meaningful share. Don't be naive about it. Don't try to be big, bold Superman about it. All you're going to do is turn off the investor because they're like, you don't know what you're talking about. There's no way you actually did that research. So make sure that you do the research. You know what you can do. You know the potential and then, you know, nail that. Five, business model. Clearly explain your business model, outlining how your company generates revenue, the pricing strategy, and any USPs that give you a competitive advantage. And if you remember, USPs are your unique selling propositions. Six, traction and milestones. You need to showcase any traction your business has achieved. Remember, we talked about that um, earlier, such as your customer acquisitions, partnerships, or revenue milestones. Concrete evidence of progress adds credibility to your pitch. Now, as I said before, if this is a brand new, fresh newbie company and you don't have a historical data of a track record, you're then going to have to go based off of your team's resumes, your individual resumes that you collectively harness and you curate in order to have one solid pitch of the milestones and attractions that you have made individually and why this collective force is, is, you know, is solid while you, why you guys are the A team, right? So you have to be able to at least provide it in that regards. Seven would be your financial projections, pre, uh, presenting realistic and well-researched financial projections clearly articulating how you plan to use the investment and highlight the expected return on investment for the investor. Eight, um, we're looking at the competitive landscape. So we would be providing a comprehensive analysis of that landscape and articulating what sets your business apart from competitors and why you have a sustainable competitive advantage. Team, you'd be introducing them and emphasizing their key strengths and expertise. Understanding that investors often invest in the team as much as the idea. So you have to showcase their skills and experience. 10 would be risk mitigation. Um, acknowledging potential risk and demonstrating how your business has strategies in place to mitigate them. This shows your investors that you've considered challenges and have a plan to navigate them. Of course, I've walked you through that. So now you know how to do that. Um, 11, asking for a specific amount. You have to clearly state the amount of funding you're seeking and how you plan to use it. You can't just tell them, give me what you think I'm worth or give me what you think is fair or give me what you're willing to part with. Um, you have to be transparent about the terms and conditions of the investment, including the equity that you're going to offer. And if you're not offering equity, oh, you better have a slamming 
um, value proposition and reasoning behind why they're not getting anything other than just the return. Um, 12, practice and refine. You have to keep practicing that pitch extensively so that you can ensure you have a smooth and confident delivery. You need feedback from mentors or advisors. Refine your pitch based on your input. Just don't rely on family, especially if family are not seasoned um, in the world of business and cannot give you um, honest feedback on how well your pitch is, how persuasive it is, your body language, your mannerisms, your the tone and um, everything of your voice, your energy. If they can't do it, don't go to them. You need to go to people that can um, give you some clearly um, clear direction and hopefully with less bias. Um, 13, engage in Q&A. So be prepared for questions because there will be questions. If there are no questions and no one is willing to um, offer you money, that's because you did not provide the answers in advance or and they just don't want to waste their time with you. So, you, But you do need to anticipate potential questions that they might ask and have well thought out responses. So you need to look through the, advan the, the lens of an investor. What I say is this, outline all the potential objections that someone could have, all the reasons why someone would say no to your ask, and then overcome those objections. So basically, I want you to destroy your idea. I want you to deflate it. I want you to tear it apart with all the no's possible and then have an answer for every no so that you then counter it. That's the best way to prepare for a Q&A. If you know they're going to ask about them, the dollars and cents, you better have it and you better have an answer to anything that there is a gap, there's a question mark, there's no, there's no data there. Um, so that will help showcase your knowledge and uh, preparedness. And then last but not least is follow up. So after the pitch, you need to follow up with additional information if requested. Make sure that you guys are expressing gratitude for their time because their time is money. They're spending time with you, which means they're not spending it doing something else. And you need to also make sure that you show enthusiasm about the possibility of working together. Do you really want this relationship? Show them that you do. So I want you to remember that brevity is key to in a pitch. So keep your presentation concise, engaging, and focused on the most critical points. You need to aim to capture their interest and leave them wanting to learn more about your business. It is truly like the art of seduction. You are enticing. You are seducing them to you, to your ideas, to what you are saying that you can do um, and the experiences that you're saying that you can provide your customers, but also these investors. You got to do it right. And you, you, you only have that, that one opportunity for the most part. Now, sometimes investors will let you come back and pitch again, but sometimes they're like, nah, man, nah, chick, no, um, bozo. Like, you know, some people can be a little abrasive. So, <laughs> so with it, just know that that is, um, key. Don't, um, you can be afraid. I'm not going to tell you not to be afraid. It is a fearful process. Be afraid, but do it anyway. Do it through the fear. Do it through all the rejections. For every 10 you get, you may get one or you may get a maybe. It may take you 50 no's in order before you get that first yes. It is fine. It's part of the process. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it and everybody would be multi-billionaires. So I hope that this has been helpful. Um, I know that I had initially um, said that we would dive into, well, pitter patter. <laughs> I said we would dive into the um, financials. So I guess we can go ahead and do that. I was trying to see if there's anything else. I'm looking through my notes to see if there's anything else that somebody would um, question. So let me see. Hmm. Let me see. Looking, looking, looking. Um, 
I think I probably covered everything. If there's something um, that comes to mind, then feel free to go to foremanllc.com slash podcast and you'll see a feedback form. You can also, of course, um, hit us up in our DMs and we'll be able to um, do that. I don't see anything else, so let's just go ahead and dive into the financial projections for the business plan. This is going to be the last component um, that we're going to dive into for today. So when we're creating our financial projections, we have to involve forecasting our future financial performance based on any historical data. And as I've said before, if you guys don't have any, then you kind of have to you know, navigate to what you do have. So it could be industry benchmarks, it could be assumptions about the market. So let's walk you through the comprehensive financial projections. So the first would be you would start with the sales forecast, right? And we did this in previous episodes. So we'll begin by estimating our sales revenue. We break it down by product or service if you offer multiple offerings. Then we consider the factors such as market demand, pricing strategy, and sales channels. So you should remember that. Then we go into cost of goods sold. So we're going to then calculate the direct cost associated with producing the product or service. And this could include your raw materials, labor, manufacturing costs. You then deduct the COGS from your revenue to calculate the gross profit. Next step would be our gross profit margin. This is where we determine, and we would determine this by expressing the gross profit as a percentage of the revenue. And so this margin is a key indicator of your profitability. And then, um, and I'll give you that calculation shortly. Um, We then next step would be operating expenses. So we're going to outline all of those, which includes the rent, utilities, salaries, marketing, administrative costs. We'd classify them as fixed, um, which is constant or variable cost, which is tied to your production or sales. Remember we talked about that when we covered sales. We then go into um, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. You normally see that as EBITDA. We're going to calculate that to assess your business's operating performance. And this metric is going to provide a clearer picture of operational profitability by excluding non-operational expenses. And I'll share more details about that shortly. Next step would be our interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Um, We're going to include that and we're going to deduct these from EBITDA to then calculate your net profit. From there, we have, um, we're going to express net profit as a percentage of our revenue so that we can calculate our net profit margin. And this metric will help assess overall profitability. The next step after that is our cash flow projections. And this is where we'll have the cash flow statement that's going to outline our expectations for cash inflows and outflows. And we'll consider factors such as accounts receivable, accounts payable, and our working capital, which we discussed extensively in previous episodes. The ninth step would be our balance sheet projections. And here's where we would summarize our assets, our liabilities, and our equity. And this is going to provide a snapshot of our financial position as a company at a specific point in time. Ten would be our assumptions and justifications. So we have to clearly document all assumptions that we've made behind our projections. And we would include factors such as market growth rates, pricing strategies, and any other variables that would impact our financial forecast. So we have to provide justifications for these assumptions. We can't just say it and we're like, I said what I said. Okay, that's not good enough. Why? And how did you get there? Um, 11, sensitivity analysis. You have to connect, um, conduct this analysis to assess how changes in key variables such as sales volume or pricing might affect your financial projections. And then this will demonstrate that you considered different scenarios so that you're not just having this um, laser focus on one thing. You have tunnel vision. It has to be that you can see the different aspects and you're looking all the way around from different vantage points. 12, 
um, as we talked about um, in a previous episode, using industry benchmarks. You'll compare your projections to those benchmarks, and this will help validate your assumptions and provide context for investors or lenders who are evaluating your business plan. And then what you're gonna do in step 13 is you'll include a break-even analysis, and that um, will indicate the level of sales at which your business will cover all expenses. So this is valuable for understanding when your business becomes profitable. Then we're gonna do a periodic review and updates, right? And you'll be looking at and updating those financial projections as your business evolves. You'll adjust your forecast based on your actual performance and any changes to market conditions. Step 15, you seek professional advice, always, always, always. Um, if needed, consult with financial experts, accountants, CPAs, financial advisors to ensure the accuracy and credibility of your financial projections. All right, so that's that. So now what I wanna do is backtrack so I can cover some things that, um, that you may have questions about. Um, we've already extensively covered sales forecasts, so I am not going to um, go into that. Um, so let's see, um, let's, Hmm. Let's calculate a uh, cost of goods sold. So calculating your COGS help understand the direct costs that are associated with producing your goods or services. So here's a general formula that you can utilize and the steps that we take. So your COGS will equal your opening inventory plus the purchases of production costs, or I mean, no, back up. Your opening inventory plus your purchases or your production costs, and then minus your closing inventory. That number will then be your cost of goods sold. So the way you go about that is first you would identify your opening inventory. So you do this by determining the value of your inventory at the beginning of the accounting period. And so this is the total cost of goods that are held in stock from the previous period. From there, you would determine the purchases or the production costs. So for a business that purchases finished goods for resale, you would calculate the cost of goods purchased during the accounting period. If you have a business that produces goods, you would calculate the direct cost of production, which would also include raw materials, labor, and manufacturing overhead. So that's how you determine purchases or production costs. The third element is, or step is that you would calculate closing inventory. So you do this by determining the value of inventory at the end of the accounting period, right? So. With that, that's gonna include the cost of goods that remain in stock. Um, then your next step would be you would apply the COGS formula. So you'd plug the values into your formula, right? So you have the um, opening inventory plus the um, purchases or production costs minus closing inventory. So I'm gonna give you an example. <clears throat> Let's say the opening inventory is $20,000. And purchases or production cost during the period are $50,000. And your closing inventory, remember that's at the end of the county period, the closing inventory is $15,000. So you plug in the numbers, opening inventory is $20,000. You would then add the purchases or production costs, which is $50,000, and deduct the closing inventory. So 20,000 plus 50,000 minus 15,000. If you're using your calculator, what do you get? You should get 55,000. That's the cost of goods sold. Now I do wanna um, also point out some things um, just so I can layer this and highlight it and place some greater emphasis. Um, you have to look at consistency in accounting methods. You have to 
use the same method consistently from one period to another if you want to have accuracy. If not, it's just a blunder of numbers and a headache. You need to make sure you include all direct costs. So when you're determining purchases or production costs, make sure that all direct costs are associated with bringing a product to market. So this may include your raw materials, your direct labor, and your manufacturing overhead. You have to include it. You need to exclude your indirect costs. So when we're dealing with COGS, COGS should only include direct costs related to the production of goods or services. Indirect costs, such as administrative expenses or marketing costs, are not, are not, are not included in COGS. Another thing is your periodic versus your perpetual inventory um, system. The periodic inventory system will update the COGS at the end of the accounting period, while the perpetual system continuously updates COGS with each sale. So I hope that makes sense of that. So that's where we're dealing with the cost of goods sold. Um, let's see. Let's calculate and explain um, gross profit margin. I feel like I did this already. <laughs> if not, I'm just gonna, oh well, we're gonna just layer it. So this is a financial metric that's gonna represent the percentage of revenue retained after you deduct the direct cost associated with producing your goods or service. So it's a major indicator of your profitability as a company. So the formula for gross profit margin is um, revenue minus your cost of goods sold, and then you're gonna be divided by the revenue, and then you're gonna multiply that by 100. So how we do this is, we first have to determine our revenue. So you, um, you're looking at the total revenue generated during a specific period, and this will include all sales and income from your primary business activities. Then you have to calculate your cost of goods sold, which I've already broken that down for you, right? The opening inventory plus the purchases or um, the uh, purchases or the, goodness, just drew a blank. <laughs> the purchases or your production costs, I'm sorry. And then you'll deduct the closing inventory. So you'll determine the costs for the same period that's corresponding to the revenue. Then you have to apply your gross profit margin formula. So you'll plug in those values into the gross profit margin formula, which I share with you in just a second ago, which is the revenue minus the COGS um, over the divided by the revenue times 100, right? So let's give you an example so you can kind of play with this. So let's say your revenue for the period is $100,000 and your cost of goods sold, the COGS is $40,000. You plug those numbers in so you'd have $100,000 minus $40,000, and then you divide $100,000 times 100. And then you'd have your, um, your gross profit margin. Um, Uh-oh, hold on a second. Okay, so with that, let's highlight some things. Oh, and that percentage is 60%. So $100,000 minus $40,000 divided by the $100,000 times 100 is 60%. I wanna highlight some factors because I know these are things that always come into play. So interpretation, a higher gross profit margin will indicate that a larger percentage of revenue is retained, retained after accounting for direct production costs. And so this is generally favorable and suggests strong profitability. Industry comparisons, you may hear this from time to time. This is where you compare your gross profit margin to industry benchmarks to assess how well your business is performing in relation to competitors. Consistency is always a factor. You wanna monitor gross profit margin over time to identify any trends. And consistency or improvement in the margin can help signal effective cost management or pricing strategies. Also, you want to focus on core operations. So your gross profit margin focuses on the profitability of your core business operations. It will exclude overhead and non-direct costs. So just remember that. 
Use of percentage. Expressing the margin as a percentage makes it easier to compare across different scales of businesses or industries. You end up making it too convoluted when you're trying to do it numerically. So the percentages makes that so much easier. All right, so we cover um, COGS. Um, let's see what else. We've covered the gross profit margin. Um, I've explained operating expenses. Um, let's see. Hmm. Let's calculate EBITDA, right? If you recall, I shared that with you earlier. Um, let's see how I can simplify this. <laughs> can you really? All the accounting folks love it. The rest of us, oh. So, your earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So everything before those are factored in is a measure of your operating performance, and it's going to give you a snapshot of your profitability before your non-operating expenses and your non-cash items are considered. So we do that by having your operating revenue, and you'll deduct the operating expenses, and then you're going to add depreciation, and you're gonna add amortization. And from there, there's your EBITDA. How we go about doing this, you first have to determine your operating revenue, right? So you're gonna have that total, total operating revenue that's generated by the business during your specific time. So that's the sales, fees, any other income related to the core business activities. You'll calculate in the operating expenses. So you'll sum up all of those, which are gonna be all the costs that are directly tied to the production and delivery of your goods or services. So that's going to include the wages, rent, utilities, and materials. You'll add depreciation. Now, depreciation is a non-cash expense that accounts for the gradual loss of value of a tangible asset. So whether that's a building or equipment, you're then going to add in the amortization. This is a non-cash expense that accounts for the gradual reduction in value of your intangible assets. So trademarks, patents, so on and so forth. You then apply those, plug those values into the formula. So let me give you an example. Let's say your operating revenue is $150,000. Okay. Your operating expenses are $80,000. Your depreciation is $10,000 and your amortization is $5,000. So we're going to have $150,000 minus $80,000 plus $10,000 plus $5,000. Doop, Put that in your little handy calculator. And what do you get? you should have $85,000 reflected. $150,000 minus $80,000 plus $10,000 plus $5,000, you should have $85,000. Now let's stress some other things with this. Your non-cash items, as I mentioned, um, that is always tied to depreciation and amortization. It's gonna help provide a clearer picture of your operational performance. Your interest and taxes, remember, EBITDA does not account for those. It's considered a pre-interest and pre-tax measure of profitability. So if ever you see someone calculating that in, eh, red flag, it's not supposed to be in, never should those be in. Cash flow indicator. We use EBITDA um, to, as a proxy for cash flow from operating activities because it excludes the non-cash expenses. So it helps give you a greater indicator of cash flow. Um, it's an analytical tool because it's commonly used for financial analysis, especially when you're evaluating the performance of companies with significant depreciation and amortization expenses. And investors and lenders get greater perspective. They may use this as a metric to assess your ability to generate cash and your overall financial health. So it's important 
to note that while it does provide insights into your operating profitability, it does not account for all expenses or cash obligations. So I do want to make sure that I'm stressing that point, um, that it does not. So we've covered that. Um, all you, you accounting majors and accountants, you guys love that. Um, okay. So I've already talked about interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Um, let's see, let's calculate and explain, um, let's explain net profit margin and how we go about calculating it. Um, that's going to help indicate the percentage of profit a company retains from your revenue after you account for all expenses. And it is a measure of your profitability. So we're utilizing our net profit, um, divided by the revenue. And we're going to multiply that times 100. And so what we would do is first start off by determining the net profit. And we do that by calculating our revenue minus our total expenses, right? So our total expenses will include operating expenses, interest taxes, and other relevant costs. To determine our revenue, we have to gen um, look at the total revenue that's generated by the business during a specific period. So that's all sales, fees, and other income that we get from core business activities. Then we apply that to the formula. We plug that in. Do, 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 do. So let's say our net profit is $30,000 and our revenue is $150,000. So we plug that into the formula. We have the $30,000. We have the div dividing line. We have $150,000. Both of those are in a parenthesis. So we know that they're working in tandem. We take that number and we multiply it by 100. That should then give us a net profit margin of 20%. Okay. Now something else to stress with this is understanding when we're looking at the interpretation, um, as I've said, a higher profit, a higher net profit margin will indicate that a larger percentage of revenue is retained as profit after all expenses. So this is generally favorable and it suggests strong profitability. We're going to be looking at industry comparisons, comparing your net profit margin to the industry benchmarks to assess how well your business is performing in relation to your competitors. Consistency, right? We're talking about this again. We're looking at over time and identifying trends. We're looking at the bottom line. So unlike gross profit margin, which focuses on direct production costs, your net profit margin is going to account for all expenses, providing you with a comprehensive view of your overall profitability. And then once again, we're going to express the margin as a percentage because it just makes it easier. And why, why, why torture everybody with these long, um, numbers that are most likely going to get chopped off and whatever, whatever, whatever. All right. So we covered that. So hopefully you feel better about that. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. I'm trying not to make this too weighted. Let's, um, Let's talk about creating the cash flow projections. They help you anticipate when cash will come in and when it'll be used. So it allows you to manage your finances, finances, <laughs> your finances effectively. So let me walk you through that. So you'll begin with your opening cash balance. That's your current cash balance. That's the amount of cash your business has on hand at the beginning of the projection period. You'll then estimate your cash inflows. So you're going to look at all sources of cash inflows and that could include sales revenue, which that will project your sales based on a realistic expectations and historical performance. It's going to include your, um, it could include your accounts receivable collections. So that's where you would estimate when you expect to receive payments from your customers, right? When you're beating down their doors, <laughs> um, it could also include additional income such as cash or interest or investments or grants. Um, third element as, uh, or step is you would project your cash outflows. This is where you're going to identify and estimate all sources of cash outflows. So this could be your operating expenses where you're going to project regular um, operating costs. That could be your rent, utility salaries, and any other day-to-day -day expenses. 
It could be your COGS. All right, we're going to estimate those direct costs associated with producing goods or services. It could be loan payments, right? Anything that is scheduled for repayment, um, taxes, anything that you're projecting forward based on your business structure and local regulations. It could also be capital expenditures. So you can plan for significant one-time expenses. That could be for purchasing equipment or facility improvements. The next step would be including changes in your working capital. So we've talked about working capital. Aren't you glad we went over this? because you have to then be able to consider the changes in that working capital, which could be um, accounts receivable, accounts payable, and inventory. So for instance, if you anticipate an increase in sales, you have to factor in the additional cash that's tied up in your accounts receivable. Okay, that makes sense? Step five would be account for seasonal variations. We've talked about these fluctuations um, based on different seasons of your business and you have to adjust your cash flow projections accordingly. So you'd anticipate periods of increased or decreased cash inflows and outflows. So you can see the trends and track it. Um, six would be factor in contingencies. Um, you've got to put in that buffer for the unexpected whether it's expenses or delays in payments, and this will help prepare you for unseen um, circumstances so that you, that you could possibly be impacted by, that would also impact your cash flow. Next up would be analyzing and revising regularly. Of course, you see this, we do this with all plans, with all type of projections. Um, you've gotta make sure that you're constantly reviewing and updating that cash flow projection as actual transactions occur. This will allow you to compare your projections to real data and identify any variances and adjust your forecast accordingly. Um, eight would be using cash flow statements um, and you would use that through from previous periods as a reference point and they help to provide you with insight into the historical cash flow patterns and it can better inform you of the projections that you're making. Nine would be leveraging any financial tools or software um, to help streamline the cash flow projection process and they can help automate calculations and provide a more organized view of your financial data. Very helpful. Um, I much prefer the software and tools than anything else. I'm not trying to, yeah, mm -mm. yeah, not happening. And then of course, um, seeking professional advice if needed, some accountants, CPAs, financial advisors, financial experts to help make sure that um, your information is accurate and credible and that as well as the you know um, when you're looking at how you're you know the projections and then present in detail whenever you're presenting those cash flow projections to stakeholders or lenders it needs to be a detailed breakdown of your estimates and your assumptions and the reasoning behind your your projections so once again it can't be because you said so or your mama had a dream um, okay, so we covered all of that. Let me see how I'm doing on time. Okay, I'm about to wrap up. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I think I'm going to just do... Um, let me see. I will do the... Um, hmm, let's see. Let's do our um, balance sheet projections. So I'm gonna quickly go over that with you guys. Um, this involves estimating the future financial position of your business because you're gonna be forecasting the assets and liabilities and equity. So you'd start off with your current balance sheet, which would be the most recent, and that will serve as your baseline. And that will provide you with a snapshot of your financial position at the starting point. And then from there, you would estimate the future values of your assets. So this is where you're projecting the assets. Um, this would include your current ones, which would be cash, accounts receivables, um, inventory, as well as your long-term assets, so like property or equipment. And then you would consider factors like your expected sales growth, depreciation, and capital expenditures. From there, you'd go to your um, estimating the future value of your liabilities. So you're projecting the liabilities. This will encompass your current liabilities, which is the AP, which is your accounts payable, short-term debt, as well as your long-term liabilities, which are those loans and mortgages. And you would consider um, factors like your expected increases in vendor payments, any debt repayments, any interest. From there, you would calculate in shareholders' equity. And this is the residual interest in the assets of 
your entity of your organization after, 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 after deducting liabilities, right? So this is going to include any common stock, retained earnings, additional paid in capital. You would then project these values based on expected earnings and capital transactions. This is definitely, those are, these are for those of you that have C, you know, C corps, like you have corporations. Um, consider working capital changes from there. You would evaluate how changes in working capital, such as any fluctuations in your AR, which is your accounts receivable, your, um, accounts payable and inventory, how those can impact your balance sheet. And then you would anticipate any shifts in the operating cycle. You would include contingencies as always incorporate those in for any unforeseen changes in the assets and liabilities. This is going to help you account for unexpected events and, um, help you better your financial position. The next step would be factoring in any seasonal variations as we've done with these other reporting, right? Um, you're going to be able to adjust your balance sheet projections to re reflect these fluctuations and consider how changes in your revenue and expenses during both peak and off peak periods um, actually impact your balance sheet. So it's really helpful. You will project your depreciation and amortization if applicable for tangible assets um, and um, intangible assets using and understanding their non-cash expenses, right? And how they impact the value of your long-term assets. This is not always applicable to all businesses. Nine would be reviewing historical trends um, it, um, in your balance sheet to identify any patterns, inform your projections. And this can provide valuable insights into how different elements of your balance sheet have evolved over time. Of course, if you are a fresh startup, if you're just getting your, your little pinky toe put in the water, you don't have any historical data. So this is something that will take place later. Um, using the financial software and tools, um, leveraging that for your gain will definitely help um, facilitate the projection process for your balance sheet and assist in organizing and automating those calculations. And then once again, seeking the professional advice to help deal with some of those complex financial scenarios and even the regulatory considerations. Please, folks, don't try to do this on your own. Um, regularly updating those projections, um, adjusting your estimates based on real data to enhance the accuracy of your forecast. You um, would also include any comprehensive financial projections where you integrate that balance sheet projections into your comprehensive financial projections. So that would include your income statements, cash flow statements, and it, that would all ensure that you have a very clear and concise holistic view of your financial future. Creating your accurate balance sheet projections will require a combination of some very very on point financial expertise, a deep understanding of the dynamics of your business and careful consideration of various factors that influence your financial position. Do not take this lightly. Um, this really will ensure, um, a holistic view of your financial future that you don't, you don't want to play with, especially if you're looking for, um, investment dollars, um, you know, if you have a goal of one day going public, whatever the case may be, you got to be on point with this. So make sure you invest in the people that can help you, um, get there and cover those. I'm scrolling through last and see if there's anything that I, I don't want to have to just, um, have something that goes on to another episode just because, but as long as this ties in and I don't go too far over, um, we should be fine. Um, looking through my notes. Um, I think hopefully I've covered enough. Um, hopefully I haven't overwhelmed you too much, <laughs> but I wanted to make sure that I covered enough so that you guys would feel comfortable, um, diving into this, but also being, able to have these conversations with various financial, um, you know, quote unquote experts. Um, but also within your teams as you're developing them and you're getting a better understanding of what your company needs and what investors need to see. Um, but also so that you're just able to, um, see the growth and the potential of where your company is from start, um, all the way through, you know, as it's growing up from, you know, through elementary, through high school and so on and so forth. So. I don't see anything else in my notes that I think that I may have to, um, address right now. 
if anything, that'll be something that I'll cover um, later because I don't see anything that's really standing out. But if you have any questions, definitely, definitely, definitely um, go to foremanllc.com. That's F-O-R-E-M-A-N-L-L-C.com slash podcast. And you'll see a feedback form uh, where you can ask questions or make suggestions. And you can also, of course, um, reach us through social media. Just send us a message and um, we'll make sure that we follow through with that. Well, folks, that was a lot. I'm worn out. Are you? Are you? <laughs> Let's go ahead and wrap up and um, get ready to go our separate ways. If what I've shared today has been helpful and um, informative, please um, be sure to rate and review us so that other people can find this podcast through whichever podcast provider that you um, are listening to us from. Um, we want to make sure that we get proper credit for our themes our show's theme songs, which are by the amazing Shane Ivers. I want to thank you guys again for tuning into the Don't Call a Small Business podcast, for sharing these episodes with others, and for your continued support. Please, please, please don't ever forget what we tell you on each and every episode. Don't call what you're planning, thinking, dreaming, or doing, little or small. Go big, go bold, or go nowhere. I'll see you guys next episode. Take care. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, there's four things that we ask of you. First, please leave a rating and review. Second, be sure to connect with us on social media. Third, head over to foremanllc.com slash podcast to sign up to our email list. And fourth, check out all the links and resources in the show notes. Thank you for tuning in to the Don't Call It Small Business Podcast, for sharing these episodes with others, and for your continued support. And don't forget what we tell you on every episode. Don't call what you're planning, thinking, dreaming, or doing, little or small. Go big, go bold, or go nowhere. We can't wait to reconnect with you soon. See you next time.